the entire book of Isaiah chapter chapter. So this morning, we're in chapter 12. Hear then the word of God. In that day you will say, I will praise you, Lord. Although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away and you comforted me. Sure, God is my salvation. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. With jewel draw walls of salvation. That day you will say, his name, make known among nations what he has done, and proclaim that is, is exalted. Sing, for he has done glorious things. Let this be all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. God, we come to you this morning and we give you thanks that you have made yourself known to us in the person of Jesus and in your word. And so as we come to this chapter in Isaiah, open our eyes, Lord, open our hearts, open our ears that we may be Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, we're in 12, and chapter 12 of Isaiah brings Isaiah's vision of God's grace to a climax. In chapter 1 through 5, we heard of God's ace against Israel, relegated the worship of God to the temple, but they left there, and in all of life, they did things their own way. He was not king. In chapters through nine, we hear of God's grace to and we read about God's grace to Israel, to Judah. In chapter 10 and 11, we learn of God's wrath because the people of God continue to delegate their faith to only the church building temple. And God's wrath is going to come to them. And then we come to chapter 12, and you heard the words. Then we come to chapter 13. Chapter 13 begins this way, verse 1. The oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw. Chapter 13 marks a division in the book. And chapter 13 will change the subject entirely. But before Isaiah moves on, Isaiah shows us ourselves at our best, enjoying God and enjoying being in the kingdom of God. I think some of the most mighty words that we've studied in this, and obviously Isaiah chapter 6, but at the end of chapter 9, we read, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. God is a zealous God. He's a passionate, bold. Isaiah is saying that this, which God intends to accomplish, will occur with a zeal from the heart of no one else than the Lord of hosts. His passion. His passion is driving history towards a triumph of his grace. His reign over heaven and over earth as the king of kings and lord of lords. And how will it happen? The zeal, the passion of the Lord will accomplish this. You and I will not achieve the victory of God in this world. When we are finally glorified and we're enjoying him perfectly, we will look at the new heavens and the new earth. We will look at the kingdom of God, fully realized as Jesus rules over all, and every knee has bowed. And we will say this. 
We didn't do this. God did it. There will be a triumph of the grace of God. And I, and in chapter 12 is Isaiah's vision of God's grace and our only response, sing to the Lord and proclaim his name. As God shows us his purpose and history, and we've seen some of that in chapters 1 through 11, what do we contribute? Nothing. What does God contribute? Everything. Grace greater than all of our sins. There was grace for Isaiah in chapter 6. There was grace for Judah in chapter 8. There was grace for Israel in chapter 10. There was grace for all of us in chapter 11. And Isaiah is saying, we've all failed. But God is not defeated. And the remedy, God's grace, what is it? Remember chapter 9. Run to us. A child is born. Unto us a son is given, and his name is the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Chapter 11, a shoot from the tribe of Jesse, and the spear of the Lord will rest upon him, and the wolf will lie down with the lamb. The creation will be restored. He will triumph. And when the Apostle Paul brings to a climax the grace of God, as Isaiah is doing, Paul's argument about the over ruling grace and love of God from chapter 5 through chapter 8 of Romans, he asks us this, what shall we then say to these things? What shall we then say? There's nothing left to say except praise be to God. Love so amazing, so div divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. That's where Isaiah is going to take us in chapter 12. When we read in verse 1 and then again in verse 4, you will say in that day. Isaiah uses the phrase that day as we've talked earlier in Isaiah as referring to the coming of the Messiah. In fact, Jesus early in his ministry quotes Isaiah chapter 61 and say, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Isaiah is describing the last days, the period of the birth of Jesus, the inauguration of the coming of the kingdom to the return of Jesus, the consummation of the kingdom of God. Isaiah doesn't give us details about the end times but he's giving us a foretaste of what it means to live in a spirit of worship and joyous surrender while we participate in the kingdom of God here on earth, even as it is in heaven. Jesus said in Matthew 12, if I cast out demons by the power of the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come in your midst. As we've talked before, it's the kingdom now, but not yet. We see something of the kingdom, but we don't see it fully realized. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 2 says this, He has put everything under his feet, but we do not see everything subject to him. But we do see Jesus crowned with glory and honor. And so what is our testimony? First, and foremost, God gives each of us, and this is in verse 1, God gives each of us our own experience of what it means to enter into a relationship with God. He gives us a confident testimony that our hearts and our lives are ruled by God. The kingdom of God first comes into our hearts. There's no secondhand salvation, so he writes in verse 1, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Our deepest problem is not whether we love God, but whether God will still love us. After all that we've done, 
why shouldn't God simply hate us? Why shouldn't God simply judge us and abandon us? Even as Christians, we betray God daily. It would be interesting to poll Christians with the question, what is the greatest wonder of your salvation? Isaiah's answer would be, you were an enemy of God. And now God comes to comfort you. In your own life, many of you have transitioned from being an enemy of God to one who is comforted by God. And you've experienced the grace and the mercy of God being poured out upon you. If this morning that is not your testimony, I would urge you to go back and read Isaiah chapter 1. You'll find the gospel. Though your sins be as scarlet, they will be washed white as snow. Jesus will wash away your sins if you only trust him. The Lord's desire is that each of us can boldly go into his presence for comfort, to receive mercy and to find grace. He wants every one of us to be able to say to him, you comfort me, O Lord. And then verse 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. Isaiah spent his life trying to persuade the people to trust in God and not be afraid and not give themselves to false saviors and to trust in other things within the culture. And his book, this book of Isaiah, makes the question unavoidable to us today. Will we trust God, not just on Sunday morning, but in all of life, in this broken, dark, sinful world, through crises, through struggles, through pain, will we trust God? Or will we fearfully surround our trust in God with mechanisms of self-help, just in case God fails? Do we feel secure in trusting in God alone? Ask yourself this question, who do you love? I mean, who do you really love? What do you love? What do you care about? Is it God alone? Is your heart undivided? Am I satisfied with God? And only God? One of the striking things about this testimony in verse 2 is its simplicity. We complicate our trust in God. We mix in other things. We trust in our theology. We trust in our religious behavior. We trust in good deeds. But when the grace of God overrules, and you have an undivided heart, and you trust in God alone, then we say with Isaiah, Behold, God is my salvation. He is enough. Period. He is enough. And then we discover that we have been safe all along. For the Lord God is my strength. He is my song. And he has become my salvation. When we experience how strong God really is on our behalf, better than we'd ever imagined, he becomes our song. Do you remember the old musical, Singing in the Rain? Gene Kelly walking down the street, it's pouring rain. And he's happily sloshing through the puddles, rain pouring on his head, wonderfully in love, and he just begins to sing. 
It's crazy. Who does that? But God has put into our hearts that capacity. God has put into your heart that capacity, the freedom to break out into song at the wonders of his love, at the wonders of his grace, at the wonders of his mercy, and to sing even in the rain. And that joyous surrender is what we were created for. And when we do, our hearts sing. Isaiah, as you might recognize, is echoing the song of Moses, sung after God rescued Israel through the Red Sea. The people were weak and needy. God takes delight in weak and needy people. It didn't matter. It didn't matter to God that the Israelites were weak. It didn't matter to God that the Israelites had no horses or chariots. And it doesn't matter if we're weak and needy. Why? As Moses sang, I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and the rider thrown into the sea. Why is it important that we acknowledge that we're weak and needy? So the power and the grace of God might be demonstrated through us. Here is the confidence of the biblical gospel, cover to cover. We're hearing it in the book of Isaiah. We hear it in the book of Romans. If God is for us, who can be against us? His power is made weak. His power is made perfect in our weakness. As Christians in this broken and sometimes even hostile world, we need to stop thinking like victims. And we need to start singing, even now, even in the rain, as we trust in God alone. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. That's the song we sing. Secondly, our rich enjoyment. Verse 3. With joy you, and the you is plural there, refers to all of us. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. David says in Psalm 63, My soul thirst for you. My flesh faints for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Our worldview, at least the worldview offered to us and our bias, often sees the world as the satisfaction for our thirst. And sometimes we see God as the dry and weary land. It's just the opposite, the Bible says. Jesus says in John 7, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. One commentator explained it this way. When the believer comes to Jesus and drinks, he not only quenches his thirst, but receives such an abundant supply so that endless rivers flow from him to others. Number three, our universal mission. Verse four. And you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, proclaim that his name is exalted. That's the great commission of Matthew 28 in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah sees, foresees the gospel spreading over the world, awakening all the people to the greatness and the majesty of God. And as we embrace this mission, this mission of exalting his name and all of life, we do so so that all of creation sings out, holy is the Lord. Back in Isaiah chapter 6, the seraphim were saying in an antiphonal response, holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth 
is full of his glory. The whole earth is full of his glory. We sometimes don't see it, but we're told that the whole earth is filled with his glory. Abraham Kuyper, the Dutch theologian, said, there is not one inch of the earth that Jesus does not call mine. It belongs to Jesus. Do we see all things put under the feet of Jesus right now? No. But that doesn't mean that we as Christians sit around twiddling our thumbs, waiting for Jesus to come back, waiting to pass into glory, sitting on our hands and doing nothing. God is at work now, bringing his rule to this earth as it is in heaven, so that his glory is made more visible day by day. And one day, one day, all things will be put under his feet. And then all of creation with one voice will cry out, holy is the Lord. But we do see now something of the glory of God, even now as Christians punch holes in the darkness. I shared with Dottie something of what I was preaching on this morning, and I used with her that phrase, punch holes in the darkness. And she goes, what does that even mean? <laughs> Only as the wife of a pastor can say. <laughs> this is for you, Dorothy. The story is told of Robert Louis Stevenson. He grew up in Edinburgh, Scotland. And in those days, street lamps didn't just come on automatically. People were hired to light one, each one, individually. And one evening, as the lamp lighters, as they were called, did their work, climbing their ladders, lifting the glass lid, lighting the torch, closing the glass lid, climbing down and moving on to the next lamp, young Stevenson was enthralled. And as dust settled into night, one light would be lit. A few minutes later, another light would be lit. A few minutes later, another light would be lit. And young Stevenson turned to his mom and said, look, they're punching holes in the darkness. That's what we're called to do. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The Apostle Paul described the result of that truth. And he writes to us, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And as we live out our lives in this broken world with Jesus as our king, as children of the light, we're called to punch holes in the darkness. My friend Steve Garber, who used to teach at Gordon-Conwell and then more recently at Regent College in British Columbia and two summers ago, he was conducting a seminar for young Christian entrepreneurs who were young enough that they wanted to know how to take the vocation the field to which God had called them, and to do that Christianly. How do I, as an economist, do that Christianly? How do I, as an educator, do that Christianly? How do I, as a lawyer, do that Christianly? How do I, as a Christian, live my life in this broken world, punching holes in the darkness in the name of Jesus? And so in a recent article, he shared what some of these young people that were involved in the seminar are doing. One started an organization focused on health issues among women in Ethiopia. A husband and a wife responded to the educational hopes and heartaches of Latino children, Latino immigrant children in Atlanta. Two others are working to bring a neighborhood in Denver out of a generational poverty. Another's taking the social and economic 
implosion of Detroit and going block by block working to bring renewal. Two women from Nigeria have developed an educational program for young women who are left out of the entrepreneurial marketplace of their city. Our own Ann Clemmer, in a conversation with Dottie, began to brainstorm about the needs of the widows on the lava fields outside Goma. And all of you raised over $4,000 to buy goats for the women, widows, and their children living on the lava fields outside of Goma. You are punching holes in the darkness. Our own Andrew helping to develop the resources, the resource center here in Dexter. So many of you helping with the local food distribution of people locally. Punching holes in the darkness. We all see pain. We all see the pain and the problems of the world, and we want to bring good news to those in need. We want to erect signposts that Jesus is the king. We all want to punch holes in the darkness. Without being romantic about trying to save the world, because we can't. But we need Christians who are dreamers of what might be. Christian men and women willing to step into God's history to give themselves away for the sake of others, being and becoming light in a broken world, signposts of the way the world ought to be if you live your life as Jesus as King. When I hear the evening news or read headlines in the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post, what I hear are the groans of this world. I'm personally tormented in my soul over the suffering of so many here in our own country and around the world. And their issues are always complex and they're always messy. Sometimes they're tragic. And the weight of the world and those issues weigh me down as I'm sure they weigh you down. And when we hear all that, we pray as we ought. What I'm suggesting to you this morning is we also need dreamers. Willing to go out and to punch holes in the darkness. On September 2nd, I was reading an article in the Washington Post on a school in Kabul, Afghanistan. And their founder and principal and lead teacher, Shabana, I won't use her last name. She founded this all-girls boarding school in 2008 in Kabul. On that night, on the night of August 25th, she and all the girls fled Afghanistan. All 230 of them, students, staff, and some family members. They're now hiding, in hiding, in Rwanda. As I read the article, my heart broke. I couldn't sleep that night. The next morning, I became curious about Shabana. I began to do various Google searches to see if I could find any way to correspond with her. And I found what I thought was an email. And so I said a small prayer, and I wrote Shabana an email saying, I'm a 71-year-old guy in the middle of Maine. don't know how I can help, but if there's any way, let me know. I shared 
with Dottie what I had done. And I laughed at myself. Not even sure the email is going to go through. Not sure it's the right email. Not sure she even has the ability in hiding in Rwanda to even see my email, read my email. And so I went to bed that night sort of laughing at my foolishness. The next morning, I woke up. And I checked my emails I do every morning. I have an office in Korea because we bring students from Asia to schools in America to study. And I checked my emails from my staff member in my Korean office. And as I'm looking through them, I notice one email. It was from an Afghanistan website, web server. And I began to read it. It wasn't from Shabina herself. It was from one of her staff members. To make a long story short, I've been on the phone with Rwanda, with the people who are with these 230 girls, staff members, and family members. And we're working right now on a way to bring at least 10 or 12 of them to boarding schools that I work with all over the country. And so I've spent my week on the phone with Rwanda, on the phone with heads of school from around the country, and in my car driving from school to school having face-to-face -face meetings. Currently, four schools have said they would each take two girls. That's eight girls. The issues are complex. I'm not sure the girls will ever get here. It's messy, there are a thousand hurdles. I've met with people from Senator Collins' office. I've talk, talked to the chief of staff of Governor Mills. I've talked to others in government. The issues are so, so complex. Not to mention the fact it would cost about $20,000 per kid, per student, per year. And if they stay here all four years, they're in high school, if they stay here all four years, we're looking at somewhere between 750000 to a million dollars that I have to find, others and me have to find. But the weight and the plight of these girls wears me down day and night. I, we, cannot win the battle. But Isaiah says, the Lord can. Because the battle belongs to the Lord. And my call and your call as children of the light is simply this. Go out into the world and in the name of Jesus, punch holes into the darkness. As a Catholic boy, serving as an altar boy and then later studying for the priesthood, one of the responses we would sing antiphonally was Kyrie eleison. Kyrie eleison. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. That's my prayer for these girls. Isaiah says in verse 5 and 6, Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made in all the earth. Shout. Is the Holy One of So there, there you are out in the world. Work the kingdom. No longer holding back. No longer holding back, but joyless surrendering your lives for the kingdom. And you are now alive with joy. And you are singing in the rain. Because the battle belongs to God. And so even the suffering, even in the singing in the rain, we're saying, 
horse and the rider have been thrown to the sea. He will triumph gloriously. We as Christians will write, we will write the last chapter of history. History. And we because of our own strength, not because of our own might, but because of God's grace is going to try great one of the real. The zeal of the Lord. We read in the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 14. Where the earth will build with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as waters cover the sea. When the communists came to power in 19, they expelled all the foreign missionaries. And it was estimated to be 700,000 Christians in China. For decades, nobody knew what was happening with the church. But by 19 years, in Christian China. Today, there is estimated to be 100 billion Christians in China. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, even as the waters cover the sea. Nothing can stop the zeal of the Lord. There is no power. There is no government, there is no Paul, there are no pundits that can reverse what God is doing in history. His kingdom from heaven to earth. The ultimate fulfillment of Habakkuk awaits the return of Jesus to this earth. All things are put under his feet. This is what the angel had in mind when he told me of his kingdom, there will no end. Jesus come, and his kingdom is in our midst. It begins in our hearts. Jesus rules our hearts. The Christians are working in the cultures around the world, establishing signposts that Jesus is king, punching holes in the darkness. The kingdom is here, and it's coming. Someday we'll return. Lord Jesus, my prayer, come quickly. But that kingdom, his kingdom, will never end. This is my final appeal to you. Either you join yourself to the kingdom of this world, which are doomed to fail, or you join with Jesus as a child of the light. Follow Jesus the rest of your days, and you give everything to Jesus. Go into the world, and you punch holes in darkness. His kingdom will never end. Why would you follow anybody else? Why? He shall reign forever and ever, King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. It encourages our heart because we live in a broken world filled with pain. And yet you are the Lord of history and you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So fill us with a joyous spirit. Fill us with the spirit of Jesus so we can go out in the world and dance rain and punch holes in the darkness by our strength, but by your mercy and by your and by your love and by your power work through. We ask for your help in the name of Jesus. Amen. Why don't we stand and sing? The battle to the Lord.